You may be seated, and if you would, turn your Bibles to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, I want to talk to you tonight about hindrances to answered prayer. If you want your prayers answered, then Christians, that's you and me, we must clean up our lives because there are hindrances to answered prayer. Now, I like this text here. Jesus is talking about us bearing fruit, but I believe in the world of prayer if you want to bear fruit, there are some things we must clean up. And that's what these hindrances to answer prayer is all about. This is part one. Look at John 15 when Jesus said, I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it. Why does he purge it? That it bring may bring forth more fruit. Look at verse 3. I love this verse, John 15, 7. He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. So in verse 2 we see, you know, we go from fruit to more fruit, and then in verse 4 to much fruit. See, if you want a faithful prayer life and a fruitful prayer life, you've got to be faithful. And if you want to bear much fruit, the branch, which is you and me, that branch, it must be pruned. And God does that so we can bear fruit, more fruit, and much fruit. So how do we deal with unanswered prayer? How do, what do we do when we pray and that seems like there's nothing happening. What are the reasons that could cause our prayers to go unanswered? Well, I want to cover 15 reasons in these next two studies that will hinder answered prayer. I'm going to cover eight of them tonight, the Lord willing, and I'll do seven more later. But my subject tonight is hindrances to answered prayer. This is part one. Let us pray. Father. Thank you, Lord, for your presence here. Thank you for the precious word of God. Thank you, Lord, that we are to study, to show ourselves approved under God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Holy Ghost, give us illumination. Let me teach and preach the Holy Ghost, the word with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Give us that listening ear. You said he that can hear what the Spirit says, let him hear. So, Lord, we want to hear what the Spirit has to say to us. And everybody said, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. What are the hindrances to answered prayer? You have a handout sheet there. The first one says, a prayer may be unanswered if it interferes with God's judgment. Now, you need to remember that. Because if you are praying and nothing is happening, it may be because of God's judgment in that situation. Now, if there had not been ten righteous people in Sodom, Abraham, he could have run, his, wrung his hands. He could have jumped up and down. He could have shouted, but he would not have done any good. God had already said there shall be judgment in that city if there are not ten good people there. So prayers may be unanswered if it interferes with what God is doing. Now, even in this dispensation of grace, you can send your days of grace away. I know when, when I say the judgment of God, most Christians, they, they leave me right there. They say, well, this is the dispensation of grace. Let me tell you something. Even in the dispensation of grace, you can send your days away. You can mock God one time too many, and God will withdraw his spirit from you. Now, I want you to look at what Paul said in Romans 1.26. Because we are a nation that is facing this very thing right now. For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Look at that. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burn in their lust one toward another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of error which is meet. The newer translations say the due penalty of their error. Now, look at Romans 128. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, those things which they should not have done. See, it's a dangerous thing 
to touch the honor of God. And any political party that refuses to recognize God, they are touching the honor of God. When they refuse to acknowledge his son in the holidays, they are touching the honor of God. When a political party removes the name of God, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice fall, when they remove that from our preamble, they are in trouble. That political party is in trouble, and you had better believe it. Because when you touch the honor of God, you have messed up. God is a loving, kind God, but he is also a God of wrath. And church, it is a dangerous thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It's a dangerous thing to touch the honor of God. I, I, I told you about uh, when Goliath came up against David and the whole nation of Israel. David goes out with a little rock and a rag and he said, I cuss you in the name of Dagon. And David said, I come against you with sword and spear. He said, I come against you in the name of the Lord God of hosts. This day shall he give you into my hands. So Nicarib, he stood outside the walls of Jerusalem and he told him, give up. He sent messengers in there. He said, I've got weapons of destruction you've never seen. And he said, what makes you think your God can stand against me and my army when no other God of any other nation has been able to stand against me? And that night, one angel went out and killed 185,000 Syrian soldiers. Sennacherib, he leaves the battlefield. He goes home. He walks into the, the pagan temple there, and his own sons kill him. So you don't touch the honor of God and get away with it. And when people say, we're going to live any way we want to, and we'll do anything we want to, and, and God can't do anything about it, that's when that person or that nation is in trouble. Thank God that there is a remnant in America. This nation is not under the judgment of God, but there are people that are under the judgment of God. And when you touch God's honor and you mock God and you do things that are against the word of God and you refuse to acknowledge Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, then you are into paganism, you're into heathenism, and you've walked away from the true and the living God. And God will judge those people. Secondly, uh, God may allow prayer to go unanswered if it's related to rebellion. I just covered a lot of rebellion right there, but there's a lot of other things on rebellion. Oh, Lord, help me to get even with that person because they have wronged me. Well, God's not going to help you to get even with anyone. I don't care what they did to you. He will help you love them. God will help you to forgive them, but he's not going to help you to get even with anyone. So an un unanswered prayer sometimes is just related to rebellion. You're rising up against something or someone. If you dislike someone and you say, I just hope all kind of bad things happen to them, God ignores that. But he does not ignore your attitude. He won't answer that prayer, but he will not answer a prayer when there's a spirit of rebellion that's attached to it. Uh, vengeance belongs to God, and God will take care of it. So just cast all your cares upon the Lord. Wait for the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Uh, David, he never put his hands on King Saul. He said, that man is the anointed of the Lord. I see people on Facebook that can't get over certain things. If you're watching tonight, praise God, get over it and get on with your life. Because God is working on you and not on everybody else. And sometimes you just got to learn how to get your own insides cleaned up and stop judging others. How can you remove a speck from somebody else's eyes when you got a plank in your own eyes? And that's what Jesus said. And so we need to learn to love people, forgive people, and just move on. Paul said, forgetting the things which are behind, I reach forth, I press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus my Lord. Hallelujah. He knew that God is more interested in your future than God is more is interested in your past. We're headed to walls of jasper, gates of pearl streets, of pure transparent gold. Hallelujah. Heaven, happy home above. Heaven, land of peace and love. Keep your insides clean and make your call and election sure. Somebody go and praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Don't put your hand on God's anointed. David didn't do it. 
And God said, touch not my anointed and do my servant no harm. So just love everybody and let God take care of all the other. Amen? Number three, sometimes prayers are unanswered as a result of an attack by the enemy. Now, I, I, I think about this one a lot of times here. And because uh, I think a lot of our problems are in this area. So look at Job 1 and 12. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon him put not forth thy hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Now, he went forth from the presence of the Lord, but he went forth to torment Job. And Job didn't know the narrative. This is the oldest book in the Bible. Job did not know that God was bragging on him. God, Job did not know that God was let the heads down so the devil could come and test him and try him. You and I know because we got 66 books. Job's the oldest book. So he did not know the narrative. But the devil went forth to torment Job. Now, here's a battle that is going on in the spirit world. God was bragging on Brother Job and how good he was. And the devil said, well, no wonder you put a fence around him. You have hedged him in. <laughs> and, and, and if you hadn't done that, say, if you hadn't blessed him with so many things, then he would curse you to your face. And God said, that's not true. He loves me. He truly loves me. And he would love me if he didn't have anything. Job loves me. He's a righteous man. He hates evil. And he would love me no matter what. And the devil said, that's a lie. And so here's Job in the middle of a controversy, and he doesn't have anything to do about it. So if you have a prayer and that you have prayed, check with God and say, hey, God, are you and the devil having a problem over me? Are y'all having a conversation right now? If you are God, then I'm on your side. Hallelujah. Let's get this thing over because I'm ready to win the victory in Jesus' name. See, sometimes we just don't know the narrative that's going on, just like Job. And that's why it's so important to be filled with the Holy Ghost, because sometimes we don't know how to pray, but the Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he said, the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us, for he prays the perfect will of the Father. So when you don't know how to pray, pray in tongues. Just shakabaho shatta, rambagunda la bashir barandaria. And then pray with understanding. Say, hey, God, what does all that mean? You can pray like that. I do it all the time. Just stay full of the Holy Ghost. And as soon as you open your mouth and you start praying, let me promise you something. You'll be out over there in the spirit world. <laughs> Hallelujah. Where all things are possible. And he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, how be it. He speaketh unto God, how be it in the spirit, he speaketh mistress. So the mistress that you're praying about, God will reveal them. That's why he gave us the Holy Ghost. He didn't just give it to us to shake and dance and shout. He gave it to us so the gifts of the spirit and the understanding of the spirit will be imparted to us by the third person of the adorable Godhead, the Holy Ghost. Aren't you glad for the Holy Ghost? Go on, praise God. I've seen dreams. I've had visions. I've seen things to come because of the Holy Ghost. He has talked to me. He has guided me. He has given me instruction. He has told me how to win my prayers, and he's told me how to win the battle of life and I thank God that the spirit of truth he lives in us and he talks to us turn him loose in your life and watch him work hallelujah go and praise God church amen say Lord I'm on your side hallelujah you know the Bible tells us even to this day that the devil is the accuser of the brethren he will go up and accuse you so keep your heart real clean and say Father, the blood of Jesus cleanses me from all sin. And when God looks at you, if our hearts condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. Whatsoever ask, we receive of him. Why? Because we keep his commandments and we do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And what is his will? His word. And if we know he hears us, we know we have the petitions, the prayers, the supplications. That we've made unto him. Go on, praise God. He's a great God. Hallelujah. I, I love to teach along these lines. Thirdly, an unanswered prayer could be a matter of timing. In Acts chapter 3, it tells of a lame man who waited at the gate, beautiful, 
for his healing. But when he did get healed, guess what? 5,000 people got saved. No doubt Jesus had passed by that gate many times. We've been to Jerusalem, and any time you go from one place to another outside that city, you have to go through those gates. There's one gate that still is sealed up, the eastern gate. Why is it sealed? Because Jesus is coming back for his church, a glorious bride without spot, blemish, or wrinkle. He's going to put his foot down on the Mount of Olivet. The eastern gate's going to split wide open, and King Jesus is going to walk right through it. Hallelujah. So that seal is prophetic, and that's why it's sealed. It's still sealed. We've been there. But you, you have to go through gates to, to get to different places out of the city of Jerusalem. And no doubt Jesus had gone through that gate many times on the way to the temple. It was the gate called Beautiful. And there's a lame man there. He, he'd been maimed from his mother's womb. And he's the beggar. And Peter and John come by and he said, uh, give me some alms. Give me some alms. Give me something. He had, he had on that robe that I talked about, the red and white robe that says he's a beggar. Don't have to expect anything. He's just a beggar. And, and they had a license to beg back there issued to them, and the Roman government allowed them to do that. Rome was in control. And so after Jesus was crucified and Peter and them, they and resurrected Peter and John, they come to the gate beautiful there, and he's asking for silver and gold. And Peter was not broke. Peter, he, he had, had a fishing business. You remember that, don't you? So he says, silver and gold have enough. He said, in other words, I don't have any to give you. Have you ever been in a situation where you didn't have any pocket change? Well, most people find that stuff like that. I always carry cash on me. Cash always works. Amen. So, uh, you know. Sometimes I walk down dark alleys and I think about how much cash I got on me. <laughs> have you ever been there? I have many times in my life in, wrong, in different countries of the world. But God has always protected me. But Peter and John, he said, Peter said, Seven gold have I none, but such I have in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. The power of God hit him in his legs. He didn't get up quick enough. Peter reached down and gave him a hand. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to help lift somebody. He gave him a hand up, not a hand out, but a hand up. And he lifted him up. The power of God hit him. He went leaping and dancing and praising God. Where did he go? He went to church. He went to the temple to thank God for the great miracle. I can just see him going in there, you know. Uh, by now, they, they've probably gotten a little cold in some of their religious ways, sitting in church and all dignified, and we don't want this and that, and, this man comes in there, woo, glory, hallelujah, woo, glory, hallelujah, Jesus just healed me. I've never walked in my life. I'm going to dance a little while. I think the church ought to wake up, praise God. Can you imagine if you have never walked and the power of God hits you like that? He went walking, walking, and leaping, and I'll just add a little dance to it. Because I believe he was dancing and praising God. Amen. Don't you think he was dancing maybe? Hallelujah. But Jesus knew that if I, if I heal this man while I'm here, said they will throw me out of the synagogue. And they'll throw him out of the synagogue. But if I just wait a few days until I'm resurrected, I'll send my servants. And that's the church. You can do it too. Well, I can do it. You can do it. We can all do it. We got the Holy Ghost. He said, I'll just send one of my servants, a couple of my servants by, and they'll pray for him, and he'll be healed. They'll use my name, and in the name of Jesus, I'll heal them, and 5,000 souls will be added to the church, and that's exactly what happened. So, you know, uh, sometimes things are delayed, but I want to tell you, a delay is not a denial. Just because your prayers have been delayed, that does not mean you have been denied. Because God is a good God. And sometimes, you know, you have to be persistent in your prayers. And I might just do a series on the laws of prayer. I got a lot of laws that operate the world of prayer. I, I, I know laws that operate the business world, and I studied that in college. So when I got into this book, I said, I'm going to find out what kind of laws operate and regulate the world of prayer. And they are laws. And first one is the law of faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Amen? Number five. The answer could be a matter of prayer and fasting. 
See, the disciples prayed for a demoniac boy one day, and he was not healed. They had been up on the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus was transfigured in all his glory and his splendor. They saw him. And Peter said, let's build three tabernacles, one for Moses and one for Elijah. And God spoke up. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear you him. Peter wanted to do what Peter wanted to do. God says, no, I don't want you building anything. See, Moses, the greatest of the lawgivers, showed up. Where had he been all those years? In heaven. Amen. And Elijah, the, old, the greatest of the Old Testament prophets, he shows up. Where had he been? In heaven. And they recognize Elijah. They recognize Moses. Guess what? When we get to heaven, we will recognize one another. We shall be known even as we are known. Isn't that wonderful? To know that they they from an entirely different dispensation, yet they recognized one another. And they came off the Mount of Transfiguration. And there was a little boy there, 12 years old, thereabouts. And the daddy comes and says, I brought my son to your disciples. They could not heal him. Jesus said, bring him to me. And the... The spirit in that boy cast him into the fire. He foams at the mouth. Jesus said, come out of him, you devil. Set him free instantly. And first of all, he said, how long has it been this way? You got to pick these little things up. How long has it been like this? See, the devil wants you to think that if it's been there a long time, it's permanent. But Jesus was breaking the spirit of permanence that day. And he broke the spirit of permanence off that boy. Bring him to me. And he healed him. And the disciples, they got embarrassed that they could not deliver the little boy. Now, I believe that Peter or John, they could have healed him. They weren't the ones that prayed. The disciples that had been away from Jesus, see, he had to leave and send the Holy Ghost so his presence would be with us always. They had been out of the presence of Jesus. Where did they get their anointing from? It was from Jesus that was in their presence. And, and John had been with him, and, and, and Peter up there on the Mount Transfiguration, and, and so they still had the power flowing through them. But these other disciples had been away from him for a while. That's why Jesus sent the Holy Ghost. He said, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And we need fresh anointings at times. But he said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Lo, I'm with you always. It's when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he shall abide with you forever. He doesn't come and go. He doesn't just come on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, revival time. No, he comes to abide forever. And he's in us, and Paul says, stir up the gifts that are in you. And sometimes we just have to stir up the gifts that are within us. Hallelujah. And sometimes, look at Matthew 17, 21. The disciples, Jesus told them why they couldn't cast the devil at that little boy. Matthew 17, 21. How be it, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Many times we have not prepared ourselves to pray a winning prayer. So if you want something good from God, something big, something major, if you want some, God to do something great in your life, prepare yourself with prayer and fasting. And then you go to God. See, if you want this kind of miracle, fast and pray before you ask God and you can have it. Self-preparation, that's what I'm talking about. Prepare yourself. I mean, I, I used to fast. I, uh, I would work my job and fast 10 days on water. Just work my job and, and do everything. And pastoring a church too. And sometimes preaching revivals. And I would see glorious things, you know. And I had to learn to discipline my body. It was called self-preparation. And my wife and I, we did a 21-day fast one time on nothing but water. And in the middle of it, I, I'd been on 14-day fast. On day 13, I got up one morning, and uh, 
I, I, I felt terrible. I didn't have any energy. I, I said, Lord, I'm supposed to go preach. I don't have any energy. And I said, I'm going to the drug to the grocery store, and I'm going to buy me some orange juice and break this if I have to. I said, but God, I don't want to break this thing. And I get to the grocery store, and my phone rings, my cell phone. Paul Jackson called me. He said, I want to know what's going on with you, Brother Jerry. I said, well, brother, I'm on a 14, a 21-day fast. This is day 13. And see, I'd been beyond that before. But what's supposed to happen is that there's a phenomenon that happens in, when you're fasting like this on day 8 to 10, your energy kicks in, and you feel like you could go forever. My wife would tell me, Jerry, you need to break that thing. You need to break that thing. You look so bad. You've lost so much weight. I said, oh, the book told me that would happen. I got a little book by Franklin Hall, uh, Atomic Power with God. And I've read that thing many times, given it to other people. He's in heaven now. But if, if you want something great from God, then fast and pray. I bought that orange juice. Brother Paul prayed for me. I went home. I poured that orange juice into a glass. I mixed half water because that's what you have to do when you, you're breaking something like that. You got to learn how to do these things because it's a science connected to it. And I looked at it, and I held that glass up. I said, God, I don't want to break this fast if you don't heal me and give me strength right now. I will have to. And the power of God hit me. Woo! I come to church and preach like a wild man that day and finish my sermon. But I, why is it so important? See, if you want something great from God, get into your prayer closet and fast and pray. Now, we fast and pray here at Westmoreland every year for 21 days. And I have put four different types of fast out there so anybody and everybody can do it. I'm one of those everybody's now I can't do like I used to because I take a blood pressure pill and that it has a diuretic and it flushes the chemicals out of my body and recently a few years ago I, I did I was going to do a 10 day and on day six guess what my energy was gone and finally I found out what was in that pill I was taking and I got my energy back and I, I learned where well, you can you'll have to do different types of fast now so for all of those that want to fast Fasting is not wa not watching TV. Fasting is is not watch. Fasting is abstinent from food. That's exactly what it is. And so I will teach you and show you how to fast if you've never fasted. But get yourself ready for battle by prayer and fasting, so you can pray a winning prayer. I like to say it like this: Stay battle ready at all times. And that's why these hindrances are so important. Uh, I go over them, I look at them, I, I, I search my heart because we are all in this world. We're not of this world. There is a devil, and I promise you, he will blindside you at times. You wonder, Whoa, wait, how did that come up out of me? I'm supposed to have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And all of a sudden, boom, you know, you're blindsided and, and something comes out of your mouth that you, you know, it's a trick of the devil, and then he'll, he'll try to mess up everything, so you got to repent real quick, say, I'm sorry, and get it all under the blood, and then move right on, because the Bible says, be sober, be vigilant, be watchful, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, he walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The Bible says, give no place to the devil. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus is purpose for your life. He said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So we need to search the word and understand the battle that we're in. Paul said, suit up, put on the whole armor. You're not wrestling flesh and blood, but principalities and powers, rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in the heavenly, King James says, in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole arm of God, that you may be able to stand in the evil day, suited up and ready. Battle ready at all times. I love that phrase. Uh, number six, the answer could be delayed because of disobedience. Wow. Some of these things are closely related. But, you know, uh, when you disobey God and you know better, guess what? You better find an altar and repent because you know, 
What is sin? Sin is the willful, volitional disobedience to what the Word of God has said. When you willfully, volitionally disobey God by exerting your human will over what God has said, you will find yourself in trouble, and your prayers will be put on a shelf somewhere until you repent. God is a good God. All he wants is repentance. And so these hindrances to answer prayer, they're so important to, to, to getting these things out. I, I was in a, a place years ago. My wife was with me. We were at it, the Cathedral of Praise. It was being dedicated by Lester Sumrall. They had a Bible bookstore there. And it was all kind of writers, best Bible bookstore I ever walked into. I mean, it had stuff in there, and I wanted it to. And I looked at it, I said, and, and I did what you're supposed to do. I looked at all that, and I bowed my head. I said, oh, God. I said, I don't know what to buy in this place. Will you give me instruction on what to buy? And I had my eyes closed, and I opened my eyes, and I looked down. And there was a book there, it's still in print. Secrets to Answered Prayer by Lester Sumrall. And God spoke to me. He said, if you can get what's in that book, you can get what's in all the other books. I bought one book. That was it. And uh, I, I've taken that thing apart, and I suggest you get a copy of it. But you will find the hindrances to Answered Prayer. Now, I like Lester because Lester would say, I'm going to give you something. And that's the way I like to teach. I'm going to give you something. But you go home, take what I've given you, take the Word of God. When I give you scriptures, go search it out for yourself, pray about it, listen to the sermon over, and then ask God what God wants to say to you beyond what he said to me. This is just the beginning. And I keep adding to it as I go because I'm learning also. We're all students of the Word. And if you're not learning, you know, I, I tell people, I said, the only thing I'm satisfied with in my walk with God is the fact I have never been satisfied there's so much more to God than we know I've never been satisfied but many times a prayer is delayed because of disobedience now Naaman could not be healed until he followed the prophet's command many times when you don't obey you cannot get your healing some people I don't believe what that preacher said I, I've had people I, t I tell them a word I said you come I've got a word for you and they don't even move on the word of God well I didn't think that up the Holy Ghost told me what to say so look look at 2nd Kings 5 14 see Naaman he goes down to the prophet house he first he goes to the king the king said why would you come to me but he goes finally he recovers in his faith and enough to go to the prophet's house and and, and then look at 2nd Kings 5 14 then when he Naaman down the prophet told him, says, I want you to go to the muddy Jordan, and I want you to dip in that muddy Jordan seven times. And he didn't like what the prophet said. It was a 30-mile journey if you go there. Jerusalem is down, down, down to get to that Jordan River. And it's about a 30-mile journey from Jerusalem. Then he went. It's named down. And dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, who was Elisha. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. So his healing was delayed because he got offended. He got in his chariot, and he went away. He went away from what? He went away from his miracle. He was mad, and he left. He left the place of miracles. And that was another sermon in that, I promise you. <laughs> he left the place. Of miracles. A lot of people do that. But he got over his offense. He got over his disobedience. And he got his insides right. And he, he went down and he dipped. And, and God healed him. When God says dip seven times. Five won't do. Six won't do. I can just see him going down. I wonder if that prophet knew what he said. One. Two. I, I don't know about that. I wonder if that prophet really heard from God. Three, four, five. I believe that prophet heard from God. Six, seven. Woo! Glory. Hallelujah. He come up and he was cleansed. He got his miracle because he got all of that bitterness and all of that anger out of his insides and all that unbelief. And he says, I believe that man's heard from God. 
and uh, he got his miracle. Isn't that beautiful? So, um, now, he left. That's, that's important. He got over his offense. See, you cannot expect God to heal you when you go around with your insides full of bitterness. You cannot expect God to heal you when you go around with your insides full of strife, jealousy, and unforgiveness toward others. If God did heal you, guess what? The sickness would come right back on you. It would come just back. Why? Because of your insides. So what I'm teaching and preaching right now, it will help you just love everybody and realize that you're doing yourself the greatest favor of all because you are the one whose prayers are being hindered. And you're hurting yourself more than you're hurting them by not forgiving them. Prayers are sometimes delayed because of disobedience. Now, I'm talking about an an, you know, answered prayer. I'm not just talking about prayer. I, I don't want to pray unless my prayer is going to be answered, okay? Now, we're exploring this thing very deeply. So if you have prayers that have not been answered, I want you to take a look at this. Look at Psalm 66, 18. David. David said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not heal me. Now, if there's iniquity in your heart, sin of any type, God will not heal you. So the first thing we should do is ask the Lord, have I been sinning? Have I been doing wrong? Have I been speaking out against others? Then, Lord, help me. I want to clean this thing up, God. Lord, help me. I want to get things right on my insides because I don't want my prayers hindered, Lord. See, that's the way you get victory. That's the way you get the anointing. That's the way you get answered prayers right there. Sometimes it's a secret sin. Something that you said against someone and you thought that God didn't hear it, but he did. Let me say that again. Sometimes it's a secret sin. It's something you said against someone and you thought God didn't hear that, but he did. And you cannot pour poison out of your mouth and expect God to be gracious to you. I cannot pour poison out of my mouth and expect God to be gracious and to grant me answered prayer. If you gossip, if you create strife, if you create division, if you speak out against God's servant, God will hold you accountable. And he will cut you off until you repent. He did an entire nation, the nation of Israel like that, and he always called them to repent. It's the goodness of God that causes us to repentance. We think about that for the son of no. How about for the saint? It's God's goodness that he wants, he desires, he loves to answer prayers. And it's his goodness that calls us in those moments. What was the sin that caused God to send the fiery serpents when the nation of Israel was wandering? It was murmuring. It was complaining against God and against God's servant named Moses. I've had people say things against me and do me wrong, and it's been years. And I can name two cases right now, and they could come right here and testify. One of them's gone. He's not here anymore. But the other one could come and tell you that no one else could pray that prayer for them to be healed except for me. They had offended me. I never did anything. You can offend me all you want to. You can say anything you want to about me. And I decided a long time ago I will forgive you. But I promise you one thing. There's an all-seeing eye. And the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is perfect toward him. You don't have to fight your battles. You don't have to hold bitterness. You don't have to hold anger. It will destroy your insides. It will keep you from getting an ounce of prayer. But I promise you this. When a person wrongs you, 
It may take a few years because God is long suffering. But that day is coming and you had better believe it. You don't touch God's anointed and get away with it. I had a preacher that wronged me and I had something in my heart and I went to God. I said, God, there's no need for me to pretend this thing's not bothering me. I said, I have an offense in my heart. I hadn't said a thing to the man, but it was my insides. And I said, God, I got to get this thing fixed. And I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And I just decided to bless him. Hallelujah. <laughs> and you know, when you do that, you can get over it. I heard Lester say this one time. He said a, a, a lady had, had said something about him. And he said something back. And he said, God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, God, I'm so sorry. He said, God, if I ever say that, this is back in the 80s. If I ever say something like that one more time about that lady, I'm going to send her a check for $25. He said, I wrote one check. $25 was a lot of money back then. Hallelujah. So murmuring and complaining can keep you from getting things from God. It's so small, isn't it? The little fox is spoiled about it. Uh, number eight. Unanswered prayer could be because of stubbornness, hardness of heart, uncompromising, hard-headed, headstrong, hard-hearted. Look at this, Zechariah 7 and 12. Now, this is powerful stuff right here now. Yea, they made their hearts an adamant stone. At least they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great raft from the Lord of hosts. That Lord of hosts means from the God of the armies of heaven. A great wrath came. They made their hearts hard. God didn't do it. No one else did it. See, if you've got a hard heart, don't blame God and don't blame anybody else. You're the one that did it. They made, look at that scripture, their hearts as an adamant stone, a hard stone. Now, look at what the next verse says, because this is powerful. This will make you forgive everybody right here. <laughs> the next verse says that they would not hear God, and later they call out in prayer, but God says, I would not hear them. Look at Zechariah 7, 13. Therefore, it has come to pass that as he cried, and they would not hear, so they cried, and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. Wow. Hmm. See, we need to keep our hearts tender if we want answered prayer. How many want answered prayer? I do. I'm going to tell you something. I, I want my prayers answered. I don't want to just beat the air with words. When, when I pray, I don't want conflict going on in my insides. I want sweetness and peace and joy. And, and if I got peace, I know the Prince of Peace put it there. And everything's all right between me and God. Now, these are some of the hindrances of prayer. And they will keep us from getting our prayers answered. Now, I've, I've covered eight hindrances tonight to answer prayer in this lesson. And, and next week, I'm going to cover, um, next time I speak, <laughs> seven more. And these are things that we need to remember when we are seeking answered prayer. These are secrets to answered prayer. Hindrances to answered prayer. These things can hinder you. And, keep, and you just be cut off. And you can cry all you want to. God said, I won't hear you. So these are right out of the word of God. Now, I, I have enjoyed answered prayer for 38 years of my life. So I know something about what I'm talking about. That's why I love the world of prayer. That's why I love to pray. I love to pray. I love Friday night prayer meeting. Because God said the fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. We come in here. We remove the old ashes. We praise God. We pray. We put fresh fuel on that. We put fresh fire. And then when we come Sunday, I have a spirit of expectancy. Why? Because we've already prayed for you. We've already prayed for the fire to fall. We, we've already searched ourselves. And, and you, know, you know, 
I have to constantly search my heart to see if there's anything in my life that I need to clean up. And when I look at my life, <laughs> love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. That's the fruit of the Spirit. I say, oh, God, I miss it so far, so many times. That Jesus, in the text I use, he says, if you pray, he said, the Father is going to prune you so that you can bear fruit, more fruit, and much fruit. So that agrees to answered prayer. That, that agrees to the will of God. That's the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. Well, where do you want to live? In the good will of God? And just get some stuff from God? The acceptable will of God, and you're going to make it to heaven? But never reach your full potential? Or do you want to live in the perfect will of God to where, hallelujah, everything God has planned for my life, I'm going to reach my destiny in God. He said, I know the thoughts I have for you, thoughts of good, not of evil, to give you a future, to give you a hope, to give you an expected end. So you can know that you know, and you can be sure that you're sure when you know that everything is lined up with this book right here. You've heard me quote it many times. It's a song of David. David is a man after God's own heart. I want you to look at Psalms 139, verse 23. David, this is the man that he failed. Anybody out there than me ever fail? Yet here's a man that the writer of Hebrews said he was a man. After God's own heart. Look at, look at his prayer. Psalm 139, 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see. God, I want you to put the searchlight of your word and your spirit on my life. See if there be any wicked way in me. And, O oh God, lead me. In the way everlasting. And that's how you prune the branch. So you can constantly experience answered prayer. Hallelujah. Search me, O oh God, and know my thoughts today. Try me. O oh, Savior, know my heart, I pray, see if there be any wicked way in me, cleanse me from every sin, Lord, said me free yes cleanse me from every sin lord set me free see i grew up in that atmosphere and many times as i that i became a christian I would be reading my Bible and I would find a psalm or word of God and the Lord would take me back to my childhood, to my mother and my daddy, to that little church where I heard the word of God as a small boy and I heard God calling to me. He indelibly imprinted those songs in my heart and in my spirit. And even in combat, when I was away from God, those songs would float up. And God would talk to me. And I would talk to God. I would bow my head sometimes. Would be out in the field or in the back in the rear. I would ask 
look like. I'm just scratching my head. I'm just hot. But what I was doing, I would say, Lord, thank you for this food. It was my daddy's prayer. I pray that you will bless it, that you will sanctify it to the strength and nourishment of my body. Thank you for the food. That was ingrained in me. That's why church is so important. And that's why it's so important that we search our hearts. And we clean up our lives. None of us are perfect. That's why we have an advocate with the Father. And if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Search me, O God, know my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin. And lead me in the way everlasting. Let us stand. Tis so sweet to trust in we love you, Lord. Just to Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Just thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Search me, O oh God, and lead me. Help me, Lord, I'm a man in need. Help me, Lord, in my shortcomings. And my failures. To trust in Help me always, God, Jesus, to know it's the work of the cross. And if I come through the blood in the name of Jesus, that I have an audience with the Father. Lord, I pray that the people that hear me preach your word, teach your word, that they realize just that it's at the cross the when Jesus cries, it is finished, that everything we will ever need. Is ours because we're ours and join ours with you, and we thank you and praise you that our qualification is Jesus Christ and his precious blood. Jesus, sing it, church. Jesus, precious Jesus, over oh, grace to trust him more. Jesus. Jesus, how I trust Him, how I prove Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. precious Jesus, oh, for 